All right, cool. Uh, I think I'm sharing now. Can you guys hear me as well? Yep. Fantastic. OK, cool. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm Jonathan. Uh, I'm here with the uh, data engineering team from Asana. Um, and as Mark said, uh, I'm going to be talking about how we uh, recently integrated Redash dashboards um, into a Monson. So um, let's see. So uh, let's start off with a little bit of context. Um, as Mark said, this is um, recent development at Amundsen. So uh, we did this work uh, back in June. At that time, dashboards in Amundsen were very actively being developed. Uh, it was kind of sort of situation where, you know, on a weekly basis, if you'd go in and rebuild and redeploy, you'd, you'd find a pretty new set of features. Uh, at the time, Mode Analytics was the only officially supported platform. And we at Asana wanted to trial dashboard support in a month uh, but using Redash as our dashboarding platform. So um, we built out a, a quick Redash dashboard extractor. And we've been using it for a few weeks. And this week, we contributed that back to the community. So if you're using Redash, you can, um, you can in theory, start uh, you know, pulling that stuff into a month now. If you haven't used Redash before, uh, this is what it looks like. This is a screenshot. The core element in Redash basically is a query. Uh, you can set up various databases, um, you know, execute queries. Um, you can then visualize the results of your queries in various forms, uh, tables, charts, graphs, et cetera. You can use these visualizations then to build dashboards. You can also build um, alerts around your data um, in the form of these queries. It's an open source platform. Uh, it was recently purchased by Databricks. Uh, so it's available in like a SaaS model, or you can self-host. Um, it's you know it's available on GitHub. It's got a decent number of stars if you're into that kind of thing. And uh, conveniently, it has a REST API. Um, so that's how we're actually going to do this integration. And um, what's nice about that is it means we can piggyback off of uh, some of the work that was done for Mode Analytics. Um, there was some nice REST stuff built into a Munson for that. So um, I want to take a moment to talk about the data models, um, how well um, or uh, not uh, Redash dashboards line up with the concept of dashboards in Amundsen. So Redash dashboards are pretty simple. Basically, you have a name, an owner, and then you have these widgets. Uh, there are two main types of widgets, basically. You have uh, text widgets, and um, you have visualization widgets. The visualization widgets uh, just kind of render query results. And so I'll show you an example of this here. So this is an example dashboard, very simple one. Uh, there are two things here. Uh, you have at the top here, you have this very simple text widget. It's just free form markdown. And then there are two visualizations underneath it. The first one is just a table that shows some query results. And the second one is actually a visualization of the same query, but as a scatter plot. So some of this is going to map very nicely to a Munson, of course. Of course, in a Munson, a dashboard has a name and an owner. It has queries and uses tables. All that's fine and good. Uh, but there are some fields for uh, dashboards in a Munson that don't map up as nicely with these Redash concepts. So for example, a Munson has dashboard descriptions prominently displayed, and Redash doesn't actually have a dashboard description. Uh, similarly, a Munson dashboards um, prominently display last execution time or last successful execution time. And these things don't really map very nicely to Redash either. So to get around this, uh, we'll auto-generate some descriptions. And uh, we're largely just going to ignore execution times. So uh, for the purpose of what we actually submitted this week, um, it, it, what we contributed back on, on GitHub, uh, we just ignore them completely. We have a partial workaround that we've been using internally that I'll talk a little bit more about. So a quick tour. I don't know. Uh, I don't know to what extent uh, you guys have uh, played around with dashboards in a Munson. Um, if you have, then there's probably not a lot to see here. Um, if not, this is largely just a tour of uh, dashboards in a Munson. So if you search for dashboards in a Munson, uh, you'll get back some listings that look probably somewhat familiar. Uh, you can then click through to a dashboard itself. Uh, again, you're going to have you know, your description, owner, various timestamps. Um, there could be tags. And it shows the tables and queries that are used by the dashboard. So this uh, dashboard, for example, uses the countries table. 
And if we go over to the queries tab, we can see the names of the queries. And moreover, we can actually see the, the query itself with syntax highlighting and whatnot. And what's not shown in here actually is uh, there's also just a, a link where you can go straight to the query in Redash. Uh, so you can go edit the query, execute the query, et cetera. Uh, dashboards are also pulled into the table details themselves, which uh, I think is quite nice. So if you're looking at a table and you want to know an example of how this data is used, uh, you can go right over and see what sort of dashboards are using this table. Finally, the other place that um, dashboards are pulled into the Amundsen UI is on the user profile. So you may have noticed that Christine was the owner of that dashboard before. And if you're interested in other things that Christine has created, um, you can you can find that on her profile. So this integration was pretty straightforward to build out, to be honest. Um, but of course, there were some challenges, and there are some limitations to what we built. Uh, that mostly comes down to things in the data model that I was talking about before, as well as a couple of things that just don't come through very cleanly through the API. So um, if I may just go through them one by one. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, Redash does not have dashboard descriptions. So um, as I mentioned, we auto-generate descriptions. The way we do this is uh, one of two methods. If there are text widgets in a dashboard, we just concatenate that text. Uh, again, it's markdown. Um, we concatenate that text and just throw it in the description field. And if there is, if there are no text widgets, then we just put a bulleted list of the query names uh, to fill that field. So this puts something in that field. Uh, it may or may not always result in good descriptions. Um, sometimes that text is more useful than others. Um, but hey, it's something. Uh, dashboard usage, and by that I mean view count, uh, that doesn't come through the Redash API at all, unfortunately. So a uh, limitation of what we contributed this week is that it won't populate view counts. Uh, this information is available in Redash. It just doesn't come through the API. So we have an internal workaround where we have an additional extractor that uh, goes straight to the Redash database to pull this information. Um, as I mentioned before, this concept of dashboard execution time and execution status, these don't really map nicely to Redash. So once again, we just what we contributed this week just doesn't uh, retrieve that information at all. Internally at Asana, we once again go straight to the Redash dashboard to fetch something that kind of approximates this. Um, but it's a little bit crude, and it doesn't actually work for all Redash dashboards. So um, this, in general, is just something that just doesn't, doesn't sort of uh, work all that nicely for Redash. One other thing worth mentioning is that uh, there's basically no filters on what we're actually ingesting. We're pretty much just pulling in all the dashboards uh, from Redash. And this comes with the caveat that like, there's probably a lot of garbage in there that might clutter up the UI. Uh, my understanding is that this has kind of been the experience uh, with other people that have used dashboards in a month as well. Uh, some dashboards are better than others. And uh, right now, it's a little bit difficult to uh, sometimes uh, discern the good from the bad. So a potential solution here is to maybe filter in what we're ingesting, only ingest a subset of dashboards that are a better quality. Or um, you know, ideally, we could maybe build something into a Monson to actually you know, better sort these things out. And finally, one other uh, limitation that I want to mention is that we did not build in a dashboard preview uh, for Redash. This is a feature that a Monson supports. Uh, basically an image preview of a dashboard. Uh, we skip this for now because Redash does have role-based access control. So it's possible that the users who are finding these dashboards in a Munson might not actually have access to see the dashboard and so or might not be able to see all of the dashboard. And so we we don't want to render an image of the dashboard if the person doesn't have that access. We've had this deployed now for a few weeks, and we've gotten some feedback um, on a month generally, as well as um, the dashboards. The dashboards have been a, a very um, hot topic in our feedback. So I want to start with the one very consistent piece of uh, you know, constructive criticism that we've gotten, which is that we have a lot of clutter in these dashboard results. So um, just a lot of the things that come back in dashboard search results or that show up as dashboards you know, related to a given table are not very useful dashboards. And so this is something that a lot of people, uh, a, a lot of our 
users of Amundsen internally have mentioned. Um, a few people have mentioned, for example, that they're sometimes actually creating things that are just not intended for long-term use. Uh, sometimes these dashboards are created for like one-off visualizations to be sent to a given, you know, an, another team for whatever purpose, and there's never really used after that. Um, so there's a, a lot of stuff that just isn't super useful that's um, that's showing up in the UI. Of course, we have had um, positive feedback as well. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of that, but um, I did want to share this one quote that uh, I found particularly nice because it's also the feature that I thought is quite nice, which is when you're using a Munson for exploring tables, um, when you have dashboards and queries linked, it gives you, in addition to the actual documentation on the table, it basically gives you example code. So you can go in and you can see, hey, here's this table. Here's a query that actually uses that table. And finally, uh, everything could always use improvements, right? So how can we make dashboards in a month and better? Um, first thing, again, dashboard clutter is probably the biggest thing. Um, you know, internally, we're probably just going to filter down for now uh, what we're actually ingesting into a Munson. But if we could build some features into a Munson to help users discern uh, useful dashboards from less useful dashboards with things like popularity, recency, whatever, uh, that would definitely be helpful. Right now, the dashboard descriptions uh, don't actually render Markdown properly. Um, so the redash dashboard extractor is spitting Markdown into that field, and it's just shooting out. Um, it's getting rendered as plain text with you know, not significant white space and whatnot. So that's um, probably a very easy win for us. Uh, and finally, another thing that's worth considering here is for cases where we can't populate a field very effectively, rather than showing the field with an empty value, if we could just hide that field um, that would probably, you know, help reduce clutter and make the results look a little bit more, um, I don't know, a better quality. Finally, I want to leave with one uh, parting thought here uh, related to how we actually store these concepts on the back end in Amundsen. So right now we're storing relationships between the queries and tables uh, directly against the dashboard. So a dashboard has queries and a dashboard uses tables effectively. But we don't actually store any relationships between the query objects and the table objects on the back end. And so it seems to me like it'd be pretty straightforward just to throw in an additional relationship between queries and tables uh, that would potentially allow for more flexibility in how we use that data and uh, you know, render it back to the user um, on the front end. And that's all I've got. Any, uh, any questions? Um, thank you, John. So Marius asks, uh, how, if at all, you ensure no PII or other secure values are present in the dashboard queries? For example, if someone created a dashboard filtering table by name or last name and address of a particular person. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question, uh, to which I don't have an answer. Um, right now, we're actually not doing anything about that. Can I throw that question back to you guys at Lyft? I mean, how, uh, how have you dealt with this? Um, I mean, you guys have an integration here for, for Mode. Do you, have you dealt with this problem? So my, my understanding is like, uh, we also don't uh, handle that part. It's like, we don't also don't handle like filter out the PI if there is anything. But we do have the preview up. For my understanding is like, uh, the dashboard preview will only show to the user that has more access internally. Yeah. But Jing knows more because he do the query. Not sure Jing is here today. Yeah. yeah, I don't think he's here. Uh, Dave is asking, uh, will deleting old dashboards play a role in dealing with clutter? Yeah, so uh, that's certainly one option. I mean, we, you, within Redash, we can archive things um, and or unpublish dashboards. And uh, probably internally, we'll go through a process of uh, just going in and cleaning out some of these things. Because there are a lot of dashboards in there that, um, frankly, I'm just not sure why they were published. <laughs> um, so yes, that's definitely one one option. 
So uh, what, one uh, not question, the comment you, you make in the presentation is like, for the search, like at live internally, we use the view count to show the relevancy. So in order to like promote some of the most used, most view uh, dashboards in uh, as a first result. Also like more provide nice functionality to just uh, index the dashboard uh, that's uh, in shared space instead of those personal space because like in personal space there's so many dashboard in. Gotcha. And is that uh, is the functionality to incorporate view count in the the sorting of things? Is that is that live right now? Uh, I I think so. Yeah. So the the search should include this one, but the view count. How do we calculate the view count? Is all internal? I think. Yeah. We send a, we send, we, we use some uh, internal hype table to get that, yeah. So, bas so basically, it's like, uh, I think Mo provide a total view count. It doesn't provide snapshot of view count during a time range. So the way we did is like we, added, uh, we send an analytics event for the total view count and do a snapshot and uh, persist into a hype table to get those uh, diff, yeah. And that's because we only want to use the recent view count, not the historic view count. Correct, yeah. yeah. Cool. One last chance uh, for asking questions to Jonathan. All right, well, thank you, Jonathan. This is phenomenal. Um, it would be great if we, we could have GitHub issues for the three things that you pointed out. Um, some of them are actually relatively easy, so I think the community can knock them out with you together. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Cool. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next up is Parissa, who is a UX researcher at ING, and she wanted to share some learnings uh, from doing UX research uh, there and uh, what the plan there is forward. Uh, Parissa, to you, and if you want to just introduce yourself and, and what UX researcher does, that would be good, since many may not have worked with a UX researcher. Sure. Can you see my screen? Yep. OK. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Perry Simon, uh, and I'm a user researcher at uh, the Advanced Analytics Team at IMG, which is a bank. Um, and well, a user researcher basically identifies uh, whether we are going the right path. So we are whether we are focusing on the right uh, problems to solve, and those problems are big enough for users, um, and then we are solving them the right way. So we are uh, creating usable. Um, tools um, that are user friendly, basically. Um, so today I'm gonna share some learnings from uh, a recent study that I did on Amundsen. But first off, let's um, have an introduction on DAP. So DAP is actually the product that I'm working on. It's a data analytics platform. It provides access to um, frameworks and tooling. Um, it provides access to data because a lot of the times Data is scattered in, at ING um, and it's not in one place. And it also provides uh, access to a lot of computing power. We have thousands of clusters, terabytes of RAM, um, uh, GPU, so people can uh, develop their models or do data analysis. And Amundsen, as you can see, is one of the tools here. So this is how it looks like on ING, which is not that different, except that we recently added a catalog uh, tab it's a place where you can see all the data sources and all the tables in one page because we, sometimes we get requests from the POs to they want to know uh, what kind of data is available on DAP because they're considering moving to DAP uh, or moving their team to DAP. Um, so that's very useful for us. And as you can see, we have not really unlocked the power of tags yet. We only have one and um, it's not named uh, very user friendly yet, uh, but we're going to fix that. So here's um, the overview of the study. Uh, I talked to seven users. Um, I, my goal was to understand um, whether they uh, find Amundsen useful because recently we went out of alpha version and a lot of the functionalities uh, were working much better. Um, and I also wanted to know if it's easy for them to use or if they think that something is missing or could be improved. So first I asked them about their day-to-day -day work, uh, what are the kinds of projects that they're working on, what are the kind of data that they are accessing, and then uh, we would go on Amundsen, and uh, I would ask them uh, to perform tasks like look for a data that they know um, or look for uh, 
and new data that's relevant to their work. Well, um, the good news was that people saw uh, the need for something like Amundsen because, as I mentioned, there is no one central uh, place that you can go and look at the uh, bank's data. Uh, so they found it very useful in that sense. Um, and one of the things that we are hoping that we can achieve with Amundsen is to encourage a more reuse of data so people use each other's tables and uh, that leads to some cross-pollination. Um, and I found out that uh, the data analysts that I talked to were more hesitant to use uh, user-generated tables because uh, usually what they're doing is to create reports and dashboards for their business stakeholders and um, they would be accountable if there is a mistake in the report because they didn't use the original table. Um, and there are some strict guidelines that actually prohibits them. But data scientists, uh, three out of four that I talked to, uh, were actually very uh, enthusiastic about uh, user-generated tables because um, a lot of the times the column name uh, are, uh, in ING tables are not very uh, descriptive or uh, there are some cleaning that really requires you to know the context. Um, and they were happy if somebody else has already done that. Um, and they, uh, the difference is that they also had the chance to go back and revise their model if some, something was not working. Then we can see some of the high level steps that a user takes to discover new data. So they would get on the da uh, uh, sorry platform first, um, go to the Amundsen, they would search for their keywords. Um, they would uh, see a bunch of results and they uh, take a first pass at examining if they are relevant to what they're researching for. And if they see something that catches their eye, they would uh, dig deeper and explore the table further. And if uh, they find, find out that um, it's relevant, they would request access. By the way, we don't have access to everything by default. Um, so the search behavior, as you would expect, um, it's different when you know the table or somebody has referred you to a table versus you're just discovering what's out there re relevant to what you're doing. Um, in the first case, you would go with this uh, actual name. So you have at least part of the name. And in that case, the advanced search option was very useful. But when you're discovering new data, you usually search by uh, the business terminology. Um, and these are the kind of things that are usually in description or tags. And right now, not all of our tables have this. Um, so a lot of the times, uh, users could not find relevant data. Um, and this was disappointing to them because that's the bigger added value of something like a medicine. So how users view tags? Um, they, as I mentioned, they think of tags as business terminology. So what's in, inside the table, how it's used, where it's coming from, is it related to loans or is it related to financial markets? Um, and there were also some other uh, more close, um, not so open in the things like, is, it ex is there external data in it? Is it manually uploaded data in it? Because that's important for, uh, as I mentioned, the data analysts and whether there's PII data. Yeah, okay. Uh, you have searched for something and you see uh, a long list of results. How do you identify which one is relevant to you? So I asked the users, which, which kind, what kind of results do you want to see first? And of course, frequently used tables is the popularity score that we use right now. But other things that were mentioned was um, tables that are used by their team or similar teams to, their, uh, to theirs, um, tables that have uh, descriptions um, because without descriptions it would kind of be useless and they wouldn't have uh, no idea what those uh, columns are. Um, data analysts really cared about seeing uh, official tables first um, and the tables that have a quality rating um, and users also mentioned that they like to see tables that are relevant to what they have already used before um, um, or the keyword is appearing in the primary fields um, and uh, similar to what Jonathan was mentioning uh, before um, they also cared about the primary table so there were some in, uh, some names with uh, test or copy in the name or a date in the name and they thought they uh, uh, just dismissed those results because they thought it's either a partial data or just a test data. 
Um, so based on what I mentioned in the previous one, um, you can augment uh, the global popularity score with personal popularity based on what the user has accessed before um, or their team um, and the personal relevance based on the tables that they have accessed before. So the tables that are from the same sources or they have the similar business context, for instance, similar tags, um, they can show up. And also you can use bookmarks to augment the popularity score. Um, and uh, the other last two are what I mentioned in the previous as well. But users mentioned that um, when they see the search results, it would be really useful for them if they can already see a snippet of the table description um, because it would really save them some clicks because they were clicking in and out the tables to see the descriptions. So now uh, they have seen a table that they're interested in and they click on it uh, to view the table and dig deeper. Uh, from the information that are available in the, on the table view, they found the table and column descriptions the most important. And everybody just jumped to do the data preview. But at ING, we have really, really strict uh, data access rules. So uh, it's usually not possible, if, especially if you're discovering new data. Um, and uh, instead, we have the summary statistics um, and even for the tables that didn't have summary statistics, user mentioned that it would be even uh, good for them if they can see one dummy example so that already they can get a sense of what's the format of the data. If, if it's date, uh, what kind of um, date they can expect. And the other uh, very important one was, of course, owner and frequent users. Um, uh, one of the users says, I can reach out and ask questions about the table. The owner would be uh, probably too busy, so it's good that we have the frequent users as well. So this is how um, the summary statistics of columns look like. Um, and data scientists especially were keen on this. And they said that they, they are already using this to visualize uh, the distribution of data. So if we can give more quanta kind of um, statistics or show the distribution or um, the uh, bar plot, that would be really, really useful. But, um, but uh, it wasn't it was more on the nice to have side because they said that this is already very good to have. Um, and I think this is particularly useful if like us, you cannot show the preview. So, as I mentioned, uh, we like users to uh, reuse each other's tables. Um, and what can we show as a signal that a table, a user table is trustworthy um, and of high quality. So of course, if it's official table, it has quality rating, it has official tag. So that's a different story. But if it's a user table, um, you can, uh, I ask people like, what are some of the things um, that you know, uh, encourages them or in the past they have uh, reused. So a lot of the examples that they gave from their past was reusing a table that they knew the creator or they knew the team. Um, and they mentioned that since we have the frequent user, if they recognize somebody in the frequent user, that's also a good sign. Um, and they really wanted to know, uh, at least some of the uh, data scientists who were more picky um, on this particular topic, uh, really wanted to know what are some of all the changes actually um, that has been done on the table. So what were the omissions? Uh, if somebody, if some uh, data has been added, manually uploaded, uh, external data, uh, so they wanted to really see the transformation model. And um, the other things were mentioned was whether a table is frequently used, that's a really good sign, or if it's been updated regularly. Um, so this is the last slide. Some of the things that um, uh, users mentioned they want additionally in the user, uh, sorry, table view of, uh, of the table de detail view. Um, so they wanted to see the list of other tables within the same data source. So if this table is coming from data source A, what are the other tables that are in that source? Um, or what is the counterpart version of this table for other countries, other currencies? Um, and generally, what is some, what are some of the related tables? Um, for instance, with the, you know, within the same business um, context or tables that um, this table has a key to. Uh, one person also mentioned the size of the table. Uh, it would be interesting for them to have a number of rows. Um, and a lot of uh, uh, 
a lot of your users have mentioned that they would just email the data owner if they want access, uh, but it would be really cool if they have already like a button or something in Amazon um, that they can, if they see this table is relevant, they can request access. Um, so there were some other uh, usability, uh, like le more detailed uh, insights that I didn't um, include in this uh, presentation because I thought maybe it wouldn't be um, as relevant to the broader community, uh, but I would be happy to uh, discuss them with um, if you're interested. Uh, thank you for listening. And if, any, if there are any questions about the content, uh, you can always uh, reach out to me um, after this as well. I'll be happy to answer if I can or think with you uh, through the questions. Thanks, Persa. Any questions for Persa? Uh, I put some questions in the chat. I didn't know if we were asking or using chat. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, let's do that. So from Tamika, it is, what are counterpart tables? Is it another version of the table with the exact data model, uh, but just yeah. different data? Yeah, so apparently um, countries don't really share data a lot. Um, so they have their own version of the same table for the data from that uh, country. Like for instance, transactions um, of Belgium, um, you don't necessarily have them in the same table as transactions from Netherlands. Thanks. Uh, you weren't asked a question. Um, what are some of the immediate things that you will act on? What was surprising to you in this analysis? Um, so the things that we are acting on right now is improving um, the, the sorting or the relevancy of the results because we have um, a lot of uh, a lot of results like clutter that was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation is our problem as well um, and so we are use we are trying to improve our score um, so the re the top results would be more relevant uh, what was surprising to me hmm. yeah I, I guess what's the um, I guess it's more important what's surprising to you guys because um, like Amundsen is one of the things that I'm working on. Um, so I'm not always on Amundsen, um, but, uh, but it was, I was actually wasn't expecting anyone to reuse uh, other people's tables. Uh, and I saw how awful some of the original tables are and uh, how happy people are to uh, just go with other user generated, even if they didn't know the own owner or the team that it was coming from, they were still, um, some of the data scientists were still um, going for them first and looking at them first than the original one. Makes uh, sense. Was there any other question? That yeah, there's at least one more, um, and that's from Tao. Um, he's saying that the superset supports role-based access control has ING considered supporting data preview or data explore functionality leveraging superset, uh, where superset will only send the data back to a month and if the users have access control? So yeah, we have uh, superset as part of DAP as well. Um, and we have the data access uh, in there. Um, so, but but the, the issue is that the beauty of a mention is like finding new data. So the data that you have access to, I would ask users, like users would come to the statistics and would say, oh, this is really cool. And I would dig deeper and I say, okay, how would you use the summary statistics? If they have already access to the table, they wouldn't come to Amundsen to explore it. They would just go to Superset or their Jupyter Notebook and do it there. Um, so for exploring new data, they wouldn't have access anyway. Got it. Any other thoughts, comments? Okay, we see you uh, shuffling there's a, around. There's a couple more questions if you scroll down in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, oh, both thanks. Daniel and I asked uh, uh, how so, official tables are defined. Okay. You want to, since you have the mic, Noel, you want to ask that anyway? Oh, yeah. Uh, we were asking about official tables, how those are defined, and kind of related. Uh, I'm curious how you guys calculate quality rating. 
Um, so official ones are the ones that are ingested from the data lake source. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Ferdan and Marius. Uh, yes, that's that's what it is. And user generated is what, um, whatever they they use the original and do any transformation, then it's a new table. Um, and the other question was quality rating. So that's an official rating that ING provides on um, the original tables. Um, and there is a department that handles that. It's not us. Uh, but it's actually a really good question because I think uh, some of the things that was mentioned in the pr uh, presentation can be used as a proxy for a, a heuristic quality uh, rating. So, for instance, if something has a description, um, if it's updated regularly, um, and some of the other things that I uh, mentioned in the presentation, uh, I'll be happy to share the link later. Awesome. And uh, one last question I had was, did you hear any particular reasons from users? Uh, what's the main barriers to adopting or using tags? Uh, so we're actually not allowing users to add tags yet. Um, we have reached out, based on this research, we have identified what are the important categories of tags. So the business context, uh, what the content, who is using it, which department, um, which department is it coming from, business lines it's coming from, um, it, whether it has PII, for instance. Uh, and we have reached out to the data owners to provide these tags um, to us. And once we have that, uh, we're going to verify with the uh, broader users um, and maybe en enable them to um, edit tags as well, because we want to go that way to democratize these kind of things. Um, but since it's a bank and it's a bit uh, more sensitive, we are trying the safe way first. Yeah, I think it's always a fine balance. You may get thousands of uh, similar variations. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's very important uh, that it's consistent because the, um, then it makes the tax more powerful. And that's why we started with the data owners. We provided a lot of guidelines on how to provide tax. And, uh, and we are hoping that the tax would be consistent. Thank you. Uh, Dave had a question. How many data scientists versus analysts are, th are in the audience for a month and with an ING? Are there other user groups that you interviewed? Um, so I... Let me pull up the, uh, so we have 450 users on DAP in total um, and about 100 unique per day. Um, and most of, well, most of them are more on the technical side uh, because um, the, the tooling that worked well first were the Jupyter Lab and the ID, um, and then we added the other stuff. So we are, I don't have the exact balance yet, uh, but we can look into that and provide that. Uh, but I only uh, uh, talked to one data engineer, and it's my goal to, in the next phase, talk to some uh, product owners and product managers to see how they would use this. Awesome. Other questions, thoughts? All right, so no, we're off cool. Thanks. Go on. Great. Cool, good insights. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Cool. Uh, next up, uh, there were some requests from, uh, I believe it was Christina, but um, it's also perhaps relevant for the larger community to hear about update on the roadmap uh, from Lyft. And then um, we thought it'd be a good idea for Daniel and Tao to come up and share a little more updates there. So, Daniel? Hello, uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a former engineer at Lyft working on a Munson, now transitioning into a PM type of role. Uh, can everyone see my, my presentation? I'm just wondering if this is working correct. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, so before we get started on kind of the roadmap, I wanna make a quick announcement about kind of the dashboards. Uh, so we recently officially released a uh, kind of the, the full version of support. On, um, on the dashboards feature. So these are the versions that you can use to, to support 
dashboards. And I think this front end part was launched uh, three days ago. Uh, so please check it out. I'm going to go over very quickly a feature overview uh, in case you missed it all. Um, but we had another presentation from Asana. Um, some things to call out here is that we added some filters for these dashboards. And then there's the data preview here that you can click. And you can see actually kind of uh, what the report is rendered like in mode. And again, there's kind of um, the query preview that we've added recently. And one thing to note, as someone mentioned, how do you prevent um, kind of PII in the queries? And I guess the answer, we don't have a great solution for that. So that's maybe something that we should look into. Um, and then we also link the dashboards to tables. Click on a table, you can see uh, what dashboards are using this table. All right. That was a very quick overview. And uh, now I want to talk about kind of the three items that we have on a roadmap. And uh, some of them are more kind of well-defined than others. For example, um, the first item here, the structured metadata for tables is currently a project that we're working on right now. Um, the data quality integration and table lineage are things that are on a roadmap that aren't necessarily f fully fleshed out. So we don't have as many details of on that. Uh, so the idea behind the, the structured metadata that we're adding is to help people know that the data that they're using is, is trustworthy. And there's a concept at Lyft that we're creating where we have kind of these official tables uh, that I, I think are, are pretty common among different companies. Um, those are currently in development at Lyft. And, and uh, we want to promote the usage of those tables. So we have various initiatives there. Um, so the, this is kind of a very rough uh, mock-up of some of the features that we're adding. Um, over here, we have our badges. And we want to expand usage of the badges to kind of show various things like the state of a table, uh, whether or not this table is recommended, whether or not this table is kind of one of the official tables. Um, in addition, we want to show some information about kind of like the um, like the SLA of a table. Right here, we have a, a mock of uh, exposing the SLA of a table and the status of the SLA, whether or not it has been delivered on time. And then we also have a linking to like the service that creates uh, this table and potentially adding a Slack channel for this table as well. And a lot of these things maybe are a little bit custom to some of the the data sources at Lyft. So we want to try to make this as generalizable as possible, but you might have to do some custom configuration to get all of this data. Additionally, we want to show things such as like the partition columns and the primary keys um, and adjust those as badges. Uh, we want to do a few more things such as exposing better uh, column statistics. And we also have work to kind of promote the official tables uh, that we're using. Uh, some of the, uh, the next item here is the data quality integration, which is um, a little bit more immature at this point. But basically, we want to integrate with an external data quality service uh, that'll tell you things like whether or not um, you, know, you, you, you set up a bunch of checks on your data and whether or not those are passing or failing. And we want to expose that in a month. So we haven't quite flushed out this data quality service, but we want to make it generalizable so that it can integrate with various things, various different open source services, or even, uh, even uh, custom projects. And then finally, this is, oh, finally we have data lineage which is kind of a big ask from many of our customers, including those outside of Lyft. And we've put this on a roadmap. Uh, what this is, is basically kind of showing the relationship of upstream and downstream tables. And some very simple use cases that you can do is you can check upstream tables to see if there are any issues um, in the pipeline to see if 
you know, like let's say a table missed an SLA, that means that any downstream tables will also miss their SLAs likely. Um, another thing you can do is check downstream tables and see who the owners are and notify them if there's any big changes coming and let them know in a timely fashion. Those are just some very quick uh, use cases, but there's so many, so much more usage for, for lineage. And we wanna make sure that this is built in a, in a usable a graph that the user can interact with. And so that's a very brief overview of what we're working on. So I'll open up to any questions. So uh, I could have to comment a little bit about the first one, like the structured metadata. So basically, at LIV, we traditionally have a lot of different ETL building different kind of tables. For example, like even for a LIV rice table, there could be many versions. And sometimes a lot of user has been confused. So let's say, uh, actually, which one should use? Uh, which one is the official supported one? And which data engineer support this one? And, and uh, internally, the data engineering currently building a new uh, initiative called core concept. So basically, for each of the business concept, they are building a new set of table, so that uh, uh, to which to we could help to deprecate the existing one and reuse the official one. And we are trying to promote those kind of uh, core con uh, concept table with uh, structured metadata, like say, uh, for example, which team is uh, supporting this one, what a Slack channel, and if there's an SLA, like from Airflow that is generate this table, is it missing SLA? Uh, also like, for example, how many users are using this at uh, this table? Like what kind of query using this table? It's, yeah. Cool. Uh, Mari said a comment that we are also thinking of data quality integration, but through reports like great expectations. I also know that Sam and the Edmonds team had also extended um, a Munson to have data quality reports from their system. Todd? Yeah, so I look at the, uh, they have a PR, I think uh, potentially we could, re, uh, we could uh, use like that because like at Live, we also like, uh, our Munson is not on the data quality. There's a different new service called data quality services, which potentially will use either uh, great expectation or some other open source tool. So uh, we, I think it's just also like, how do we link the data quality report into the Amazon page to provide better signal? Got it. Yeah, so in our case, it's like we are working on this uh, integration for reports in general. And this, uh, this week or the next one, we are uh, introducing the first draft, like internally, which is the, I think Pandas profiling uh, report. Not sure if you're familiar with those, but the idea is the same. So these are like HTML reports. So from the um, Amazon UI, you will be able to click on the uh, report name and it will materialize in the menu window. And these reports will be, in our case, calculated on, on the official tables at some fixed periods of time. So probably if we will have some working prototype like end to end, we'll get back to some kind of demo of it. But it's it's very close. I, I think that the development version is since today is, is ready, so it's 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 rather soon. I think we lost you, Marius, but the parts we, we caught was um, that you were building data quality report integration and that you will share with us as you make progress on that. Hi, sorry. So maybe to reiterate, uh, we are starting with Pandas profiling as a first step to inter introduce the reports. The logic would be the same for the data quality, and we are also doing that. Uh, and the summary was that the working prototype has been and uh, deployed today, so we are very close to like showing the. You can almost touch it, uh, so we we'll, we we'll probably get back once we are ready to. Yeah, the idea of that one is to at least uh, return the links for the reports from the metadata service, and then display a drop down in the front end where you can navigate to that particular report from the front end. That's the whole idea. So you can have multiple reports on the table detail page. 
and that would be completely customizable, configurable from the metadata and from the front end. And these are these can be both like pandas profiling or the data quality. So we're looking into both actually. And uh, to that we made, today we made the first demo open, I think. Uh, so awesome. Then there's one question from Arthur. How would table lineage be constructed? Would it be from Airflow DAGs or parsing the code slash execution plan in the ETLs? So uh, at Lyft, like we have a central query log, which log all the queries sent over to either Hive or Presto. So the way we uh, internally, we currently have a vendor service uh, for lineage information. That's why we haven't like uh, previously prioritized like showing like the lineage itself, like just provide, a, uh, for example, I know Alice provide lineage UI as well. So we, what we did is, is like showing the extra link from Amazon table UI to that lineage page. But what we plan is like to bring the native lineage uh, UI into Amazon's uh, first. Like, so that you don't need to like, switch around between different tools. Internally, uh, the, the lineage information is like we get the parsing lineage uh, from the vendor service first, and then show it the, in the UI in Amazon. Later, if we could build our lineage uh, parsing functionality on our own, then we could yeah, leverage our, this, uh, the tool ourselves. Yeah. So Tao, am I hearing you say that there's actually the third category, which is parsing the query logs to generate lineage? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there's a Hive hook. First, get all the Hive query to centralize as a table. Then you could build a, a query parser to, to get the, the either table lineage or column lineage based on all the query. Oh, thank you. Other questions? Uh, uh on to what you just just said, uh, Tao, um, I I think it's interesting that you said it was uh, com cumbersome to navigate to the other lineage tool. So I'm I'm wondering uh, if there's a parallel to um, navigation to a different um, to a different uh, data quality tool. And and how I mean it is just the navigation to uh, to a different uh, page. Or... So there's uh, there's a lineage to uh, in a different so it's a vendor services that live use currently. So mm -hmm. basically, it's a different UI. But the UI for the lineage is very clunky. It's like basically, it, oh. uh, it, if you have many level of lineage, it will show everything in the same graph. And people also often need to like navigate between uh, one and twos. So what we want is like, building a single service. Like you don't need to switch around between uh, Amazon and that tool. And you could still see the lineage within Amazon. This also could help other community members to leverage lineage on their own, yeah. Yeah, OK, cool. So it's not so much related to logging in or, or clunky navigation, but just the presentation of the tool itself. Cool. And then uh, one question from Volke is, how do you get the info from 2, which is S3 to table 1 to table 2? I don't think we have that. I know your talk. <laughs> but yeah, once we upgrade Airflow, which what we currently did, we hopefully could leverage some of your work. Of yeah, building. Okay. yeah, yeah, really nice leading question there. And I'm glad you're not driving. So Daniel, thank you for showing this roadmap information. This was really helpful. Um, I would actually vote for maybe trying to do um, things like this maybe regularly now that we're doing the, the, the community meetings monthly, maybe quarterly. We can just have a quick update on the roadmap, things that are coming. I, I really like that you showed the, the mock-ups just to give us an idea of what's actually coming. This was really helpful. Um, I have a few follow-up questions, mostly around just communication. Um, other than these community meetings, what's the best communication channel for us to monitor in order to get updates of the roadmap? So either reprioritizing things or as these items that you talked about move through, design into development, what's the best communication channel for us to follow so that we can stay up to date as to what's going on? Yeah, we'll likely make um, regular announcements in the Slack channel, and then we'll try up to, uh, we'll put some more effort into keeping the roadmap document on the GitHub page updated, 
And we also have uh, kind of like this documentation website that Tao has built. Um, but I think I think there's multiple channels that we should do a better job of broadcasting. And I'll make that an action item to to do a better job there. I that's a great point, Christina. I think this is one of the hard and challenging parts of open source communities because in some ways the roadmap is owned by multiple organizations, multiple individuals. Mm -hmm. So um, I would take that just as a reminder for all of us to, as we are thinking of new things, we like proactively share them in the channel or GitHub PR issues um, so we can discuss them. And uh, and the, the process can be helpful here of the quarterly, and I think we should definitely do that. But I also think we should all build in a habit of sharing that um, and I, you know, I'm definitely guilty of that, but I think we all um, should be mindful of that too. Yeah. yeah so, I, sorry. Yeah. I I sometimes encourage like if someone like posts a link or some proposal in the Slack, I encourage them like to uh, move it as a GitHub issue with documents because like in Slack sometimes we we currently use a free plan and some of the message will get lost. But in mm -hmm. GitHub issue, we help to keep track and people could help, help to comment on the one. For example, like Alicia from Square is like recently, uh, she recently promoted like uh, the Neptune or Gremlin loader. So it's also interesting proxy uh, features. So I would encourage like a lot of new feature if propose put a GitHub there, uh, issue there and then people could help to comment. And, yeah. Yeah, that would be great. And maybe then also if we can link from the roadmap page into those issues so that people who want to dive deeper into the actual issue and the communication can then easily navigate into that. Um, I would also suggest if we could do something similar for releases as well, like Daniel opened up his presentation with like, there are new versions available and here's what they are. If we could put that into Slack as well, of there's a new version available and maybe a link to release notes detailing what actually changed. Um, because for those of us who, like we've discussed this before, we maintain our own fork of the code. And for those of us who have to pull in changes, it would be a really helpful signal for us of um, there's there's a significant change that is worth pulling in. And it would just make it a little bit easier for us to have similar communication around when new releases were available. Uh, yeah, this is great feedback. Can we, um, I can take the ownership to to help move some of this forward and then in the next meeting, we can review some of the changes and get feedback on that. Yeah, that would be great. Christina, uh, two points I found useful. Uh, the front end uh, usually has, when a release is made, if you go to the release page there, there's a pretty good uh, placeholder for what happened in the past. And also, you can, if you look at the history of the roadmap map page, it's sort of, uh, says what, what was the plan. So mm -hmm. that's also part of what was built. And So maybe uh, it should actually be elevated into uh, some kind of uh, uh, history in reverse. It's yeah, uh, of a or or just, or just like, yeah, like, I don't know, I don't know if we can use GitHub hooks or something. So even, even something like a, a, a roadmap page is updated in GitHub or the release page is updated in GitHub just automatically push a message into Slack to say there's something new there. Like there's, there may be just um, opportunities so for I, uh, So there is a, uh, sorry. So there is already a channel called GitHub Review. So we already did some yeah. integration between GitHub and uh, GitHub and the Slack. So that every time there's a new PR or new release or any comment, you will push a notification to that channel. So feel free to join that one so that sometimes you could see the update. Thanks, I didn't know that was there. Oh yeah, but that's that's pretty granular. Yeah, that's, that's everything. <laughs> yeah, well, we're at time, and we we can continue the discussion. I, I feel like this is an important one, and we can talk more about it next on Slack channel. I want to thank uh, John, Parissa, Daniel, and Tao for presenting. Uh, if you have any follow-on questions, feel free to tag them. And lastly, like um, whether you're working on something cool or something you think is uncool, it's always a good topic to bring to the community meeting. So if you have something to talk about, do let me know. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye.